What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DK Garage. I'm Jeremy, that's Joe, and this is the Race Day Rundown. We're at the Charlotte Road Course, also known as the Roval. There's going to be a lot of fun because this is an elimination race, and we're going to get into all the nitty-gritty, the, get our, our, give our impact scores, but uh, we'll get a race preview started. But before that, if you want to get in our free weekly DraftKings contest, go ahead and dra uh, drop your DraftKings tag below in the comments, and we'll get you invited to that, and you'll be on the weekly invite list. A lot of fun. We enjoy g competing every week there. Jeremy, you want to kind of... Um, I guess unpack this with a little quick race preview. Yeah, so this is the fourth time that we'll be going to the Charlotte Roval in its existence. Um, the first three races honestly have been really exciting. The first two in particular were just, I mean, the first one, who can forget the first one? Jimmy Johnson go for that win, spinning out, taking out the leader. We see Ryan Blaney get in there for a win. Chase Elliott's coming off back-to-back -back wins uh, at the Roval. Still looking good on road courses, but he's got a strong contender with Kyle Larson. So the way that this race is going to shape up, it's a 109-lap uh, event, which is a little bit longer for road courses. You have a few more laps, so there are more performance points because the track is only a 2.28-mile uh, course. Still fairly long, but not anywhere close to like Road America, where it's like over four miles. There are 76.3 performance points up for grabs. The stages are going to break down 25 first stage, 25 the second stage. We have 59 in the final stage. It's a pretty long run there. And um, there will be a comp caution at lap 10. Uh, so things could get pretty dicey pretty early. When you go back and kind of analyze this race, it's... <laughs> It really seems to be the teams that do well, get good finishes, are really the teams that just don't make any mistakes. We saw it once with Chase Elliott making a mistake and coming back to win, but everyone else who's made a mistake, who's hit the wall or blew a couple of chicanes or something like that, they don't seem to be able to recover as easy. This is a tough track to maintain your track position, advance it. So guys really got to be on their game the entire race. Yeah, and you've got the uh, playoff drivers, this being an elimination race, really having to fight for some positions potentially. And all of them will start at the front of this pack, makes it really interesting. But we start the, the top of the salary board on the DraftKings slate with a non-playoff driver, but the Xfinity winner, A.J. Allmendinger, 11,200 starting 33rd. And I've given him an impact score of 9.5 because I think we're going to have to talk about strategy here because there's a couple different ways you could approach this. We're going to need place differential but we're going to have to find those guys that have the path to dominating. And uh, are we going to see a couple different dominators with some leaders, all that. But Almondinger seems to find a way potentially to fit into this with that place differential upside. He obviously is a road course ringer. I like him a lot being that uh, even though he is priced there, that path value looks strong. Yeah, I'm going to be on a nine on uh, Almondinger. I uh, see you like him just a little bit more. Um, than I do. You're at a nine and a half. And he's got a pretty easy path to value. But you kind of talk about strategy. And I think the thing that we're going to have to um, really look out for, well, I, I guess you can't really say look out for, we just don't know. When we get to Chase Elliott and we talk about Larson, if they kind of split these laps dominating, or if we get another guy that kind of dominates and do three, they may not be worth it, and then Almendinger has to be in your lineup. But if we see one of those guys really get out front and dominate, I don't know if the salary, the price that Almendinger costs this week, unless he's going to get a top 10 for sure, which we've seen him struggle a couple times. We also saw him win an Indy Road Course. I think Almendinger is a little bit of a, a tough play uh, just given the price that uh, he is on the salary board, but there's so much PD upside, it's hard to ignore that. Um, which way are you kind of thinking about building your lineup? So are you thinking going to a Chase and PD or Kyle and PD? Or are you thinking all PD? How how do you 
intend to approach this race? Well, with the way that the pricing structures worked and with as much value as I see kind of in the middle of the field, and I think there's a lot of chalk in the middle of the uh, the, the slate, if you will, starting with like Matty D, Tyler Reddick, and Chase Prisco. We'll talk about them here in a minute. But there's a lot of value to be had in that uh, $7,000 range, and I think that you can really build some solid lineups with a, a, a Chase Larson stack or even doing a – uh, a Larson Almondinger or a Chase Almondinger if you want to uh, make sure that you've got that place differential upside. There's a multiple ways to approach it. Depends on how you want to look at it in a tournament setting versus a cash setting. I feel that Almondinger is more of a cash play. Um, so that's where I tend to lean. How about yourself? Yeah, I've, I've played around with building a few lineups. Um, nowhere near at the time I'm recording this, uh, setting up like I don't have my lineup set yet I'm going to be experimenting with it so I can't say entirely for sure how I'm going to end up but I think it's going to be one or the other I don't see myself putting too many lineups together with both Chase Elliott and Kyle Larson I think there's too much PD upside in other drivers um, you know some that we'll talk about that are cheaper but also still a little bit pricey and so if you try to do a Larson Elliott stack and I'm, and of course, this strategy is t- geared a little bit more towards a GPP build. I think if I'm doing cash, I think I'm potentially looking at some Chase and Elliot or Chase Elliot and Kyle Larson stacks, just because, hey, they're the two best guys, and you may not see too many guys doing that same stack. But u- ultimately, I think just to hit, if you're trying to hit closer to the optimal lineup, I don't know if I can see Elliot and Larson both being in the optimal. Well, let's talk Chase Elliott, 10,700 starting eighth. I've given him an impact score of nine and a half. I think he offers a great path to value with being that uh, starting that eighth position. He has um, that, I guess, strong ability to, we've seen the wins in the past and everything, so it sets up well for him. But with Kyle Larson in the mix, you kind of almost want to have exposure to both. We just got done talking about that. I like having exposure equally to both of these guys um, because I've landed on a nine and a half on Kyle Larson too. Yeah, we're, we see uh, Elliot and Larson the same um, nine and a half really across the board. The thing that I'm also, I don't know how it's the team's going to really approach this race. Chase Elliott is not safe to the next round. He's only what nine points above the cut line. Um, he should be fine. I, but I'm wondering, you know, this, this, the winning strategy is probably going to be pit before the end of the stage um, or before both stages and then set yourself up for that final stage. But if he's still, you know, looking for those playoff po- or the, the extra points to advance the next round, that might screw him up for the potential win. So we might see him run er- good early where we might see Larson do a different strategy and try to go for that win. So I'm kind of talking about both of them. You know, Larson, he's the next guy on the salary board. I mean, they are, <laughs> DraftKings got him right by side by side, and for good reasons. Uh, he's 10,300. He's starting 10th, so he does offer a little bit more PD upside there. Uh, but it's really tough, and it's, I mean, even in our projections, it's pretty close. So, yeah, nine and a half for me for both of those guys. Yeah, I'm there with you. In my view, it's hard for Chase Elliott to three-peat. It's hard for anybody in this sport to three-peat at a track. That's why I think if there is a difference there i might lean a little bit more larson two place differential upside and he's got uh a strong showing this year on road courses and he didn't do it at uh, Watkins Glen earlier this year he had the opportunity to three three pete and his teammate kyle larson beat him but he was running him down so i really think we're in for one heck of an epic battle between these two i hope that's what we get uh, but there are some other road course guys who've really emerged that we're going to get to here in just a minute it won't be easy for these guys but man i think that uh, they they're going to be the class of the field most of the day but for lineups it does make it difficult martin truex ten thousand one hundred starting fifth is another guy you have to talk about when you're talking uh road courses he's a strong performer in this setting i've given him a nine though i think uh starting fifth those guys we just talked about offer a little bit more path to value but he's a he's a strong contender for sure yeah i'm gonna be at an eight and a half on truex and it's just he seems to be a little bit behind maybe equipment wise I don't necessarily want to say talent wise um, but he's just you know we saw it at Sonoma he was he had a good strong run that day but he was third behind Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott so with him starting fifth there's not a ton of PD upside 
I think he could get third. He could even get second. I mean, it's certainly possible. He's got the talent, but uh, I'm going to be a little less on Martin Truex than I will be on some of these other guys. The next guy is interesting. Um, we differ quite a bit in our impact scores. Kyle Busch, 9,900, starting ninth. I've given him an impact score of 7.5 because he's shown really great ability this year in r the road course settings. Out of the six races, he's got three top fives. Has the third best driver rating overall behind Chase Elliott and Carl Kyle Larson. I really like him. He run won at Road America earlier. He needs to have a strong race based on where he is at in the playoffs uh, setting. He is there kind of tied with Chase Elliott plus nine uh, above the cut line. So I'm looking for him to have a strong performance, but uh, you're a little bit different uh, on your impact score where compared to where I landed. Yeah. Um, it's So between our scores, we're at a six, and I feel like that's probably a fairly fair rating for Kyle Busch at this track. Um, and given his kind of performance, you seem to be taking the approach of, Hey, he's been running a better at road courses. Um, he needs that good finish, which you are hundred percent correct. He does. He is not safe by any means. I'm looking at it this way though, at three, uh, Roval, the three Roval races we've had, his average finish is 33rd and he has a zero top twenties. So that means he doesn't have anything better than that. Uh, been a really tough track for him. He's ran well here at times but he doesn't seem to be getting the finishes and ultimately that's what we need because i don't know if we really see kyle bush out i think he can get some fastest laps but i don't know if we're going to see him lead the laps so if he's not picking up those performance points and then he slips at some point in the race and has a bad finish there's very little upside in playing uh kyle bush in my opinion so i'm at a four and a half i'm just I, for me it's just one of those things where it's like I'm going to play that side of the odds. You're playing the other side of the odds. One of us is going to probably end up being correct. Um, I just, that's just kind of how I am on I call this this week. It's just a, it's a tough play for me given that price tag. William Byron, 9,700 starting 11th is an interesting play. I think we both landed on an eight with him because we see he's got great performance at the Roval, but I'm a little concerned on his overall statistics on road courses or I'd be a little bit higher on wanting to give him a, a, a b decent score because he is starting in 11th and offers place differential, and they've been fast this year. He, he really can drive road courses. He's had a couple races here at the Roval where he started up front and led quite a few laps early on, not getting the results that we'd really like him to see, though. And we've seen that at other road courses this year. I think it was at Sonoma, um, Road America. He's led laps. He looked fast, but something happened during the race that took him out of contention. I think in Sonoma, he had some sort of, I think he either wrecked or had some sort of mechanical issue and he finished like last, but he had laps led. Um, it's really going to be, well, can William Byron just finish this race and not get a bunch of damage? Because if he can, he literally has the opportunity and the ability to win this race. He can get around it. He's got the Hendrick power. So, you know, his teammates are fast this year on road courses. He can be too. He's a dangerous, dangerous guy um, for these other playoff drivers who are above the cut line, but just barely. But ultimately, and I like him, I'll be trying to find ways to play him. I'm at an eight, uh, but I am a little worried about that inconsistency in his finishes. Denny Hamlin, 9,500 starting first. I've landed on an eight with him as well. He has a path to value being on the pole, being able to dominate, already kind of locked in. I don't see him having to struggle as much. Um, so I'm looking at having a little bit of exposure, but I don't want to go too much over the top because he's got pretty strong performance history on road courses this year, but the Roval hasn't been too kind to him. Yeah, I'm wondering, so we don't know the tech results yet, so we don't know if anyone's going to the back. I don't recall Denny Hamlin being a control car at any point restarting these races here. And we know how hard that first corner is heartburn turn we heard rick allen say it a million times every race but we've seen chase blow the corner we've seen uh brad kyle larson blow this corner other drivers have blown this corner um at some point and getting other people involved so what i was just looking at okay so hamlin's first probably going to take the inside that means logano is going to be behind him brad's going to be on his outside and then he'll have his teammate kind of diagonal from him if he messes up just a little bit, I would not be surprised to see Logano get in the back of him and rough him up. 
my point in saying this is, is the only way, in my opinion, Denny Hamlin works out is he's got to lead at least the first 10 laps for the comp caution. Hopefully he comes out first and he can lead a few more before more than likely getting uh, passed by one of the guys that we've already talked about. But if he doesn't do that and he just kind of finishes fifth, sixth, something like that, it's not really going to be worth it. So for me, I'm going to be at a seven. I like Hamlin. He'll be different. He'll be low owned, but I think it's a tough play. Ross Chastain, 9,300 starting 27th is really the first big place differential play. And I don't know how much exposure I want. I, I think he's a strong candidate for being in a optimal situation. I've given him an eight and a half, but I think there's a lot of value to be had below that. I tend to lean a little bit stronger towards but I do want Ross Chastain because he has shown the ability in road course settings this year to be a strong play and has reached uh, value very easily in some of these road course races. So I do want to have some um, exposure. That's why I landed an eight and a half. Ross Chastain, 50% of the time, he's been 100% worth playing. He has three races out of six on road courses where he's finished inside the top 10. Been great. The other three, not so great. I will be on uh, Ross Chastain for sure, even at that price tag, twenty seventh. I think he's, I think he'll move up. I think he'll have a pretty good day. Um, I think his path to five X or more is certainly within reach. He's not my favorite PD play on the board. We'll get to those guys here in a second, uh, but I'm gonna be at an eight and a half on Chastain. I really like him. A guy that I find that's gonna be, I feel that's gonna be in an interesting spot is a guy below him. On the salary board, Ryan Blaney, 9,100. He starts sixth. He won the first race here. Mention mentioned that. He has good road course like results in his career. Uh, I think he ultimately finished second at the Indy road course earlier this year. But ultimately, Penske seems to have had some issues with their equipment, most notably their brakes, which you definitely have to have at this track. Personally, I'm at a seven and a half on Blaney. I've been kind of more reserved on Blaney. You seem to be a little bit more on Blaney this year. Where are you thinking we get out of Blaney in that uh, 12 team? I'm at a seven and a half. I think this could be a track we see him struggle at. Um, Penske as a whole could potentially have some issues. We've seen the brakes come into play. We talked about that in our podcast. If you want to check our our full um, version of the podcast, you can check the link above. But yeah, there's a lot to be said with some of the issues that we've seen, but they can also be strong in road course settings. We've seen Joey Logano really be strong at some points as well. So I do want some exposure starting sixth. It's a little bit of a discount off Chase Elliott and Larson to shift two and GPPs. That's where I would play them. All right. What about Alex Bowman? He starts 12th. He's 8,900. I'm at an eight. And again, it's like every week with him, it's like Jekyll and Hyde because we've seen him not do great here. But we've also seen him run really strong. He has to, he is in a must win. I don't think he can point his way in. I mean, almost every other playoff driver would have to wreck out and then have a you know a top five finish for him to advance on points. Um, are you going to be playing Bowman much? I mean, obviously it's going to probably depend on how many lineups you decide to enter. Um, where are you sitting at with Bowman? Yeah, I've given him an eight on my impact score. I think he offers a strong path to value starting twelfth. That place differential is nice, and he's the <clears throat> I guess, epitome of what you look for for a uh, tournament play. I like him there. Not so strong um, on him in cash games, so this week. All right, here's an interesting question. So next guy on the list is Kurt Busch. He's 8700 He starts 13th. So he's $200 cheaper. He's get one more uh, PD position upside. We're at eights across the board. If you have five, your five other drivers already selected and you can get Alex Bowman or Kurt Busch, and let's say you have to choose between one of them two, who would you give the nod to, Bowman or Kurt Busch? Just slightly Kurt Busch. He's just been a tad stronger in road courses overall. If you look at the breakdown on the six races, one additional top ten. Uh, that's just the, the the nudge that I need to uh, push him over Alex Bowman. And I'm going to go with Alex Bowman be, only be based on the narrative that he has to perform well and he might do something a little bit more aggressive than Kurt Busch would at the end of the race to improve his position. But other than that, I'm with you. Kurt Busch has been a little bit more consistent on the road courses this year. 
Brad Kozlowski, 8,500, starting second. Somebody we've talked about back and forth all week trying to figure out where we're going to place him, and I'm surprised we both landed on the score we did. We landed on a six. I was looking at trying to find a way to get him into my lineups, and with that second starting position, I don't see a, a lot of upside. Like They've been fast, but he's also we've also seen him struggle in road course settings at times. It's just a hard what place to uh, fit him in, but I think he's a – great tournament play and is somebody you could shift to and build around in, in that setting, but I don't want to have any exposure to him in cash. Yeah. When it comes to Brad, it really kind of comes down to, okay, do you want to rely on the stats from the previous three oval races or the road courses that we've already seen this year? Cause there's a pretty big difference. He's the eighth best driver, um, according to driver rating and at the Roval, I th- believe he's led laps in every race um his average uh, laps led is 13 over those three races one top five but he has had some questionable finish average finishes 18th so that's kind of on par and then when you kind of go over and look at him at the road course when we look at driver rating he is the 22nd best driver that's pretty i mean no offense if you happen to see this, Mr. Custer, um, but Brad, but Cole Custer is ahead of Brad on road course, according to driver rating. Austin Dillon, who struggles pretty consistently at road courses, he also has a better driver rating. So it really is tough choosing for uh, Brad. We are both at sixes. I think there's some upside there. He might get around Hamlin early, gets maybe lead those first 10 laps. But, man, those – the brake issues and his driving style this year on road courses is very worrisome. Christopher Bell, 8,400 starting fourth, is somebody that we've seen win on a road course in a similar style racetrack with the uh, part oval configuration that we've got this weekend. He did that at Daytona earlier in the year at the road course. I've given him an eight because I think we could see him with a little bit of a discount, be an alternate to Chase Elliott and Larson in a dominator position potentially because he won't have to do too much to pay off that that price tag of $8,400. Christopher Bell is very close to being in a must win. He could have a good first two stages if he decides to stay out on points and the other playoff drivers decide to go a little bit more for the win. He might be able to point his way in. I don't think that's the strategy they're going with. I think they're probably going to have to strategize for for the win. We'll ultimately see how that plays out. But the reason why I'm kind of going through this, maybe we've talked about one that you feel higher on. Maybe we haven't talked about one yet. But in my opinion, and tell me if you agree or disagree, You know, I think we both agree Larson and Elliott are the most likely to win this race and rack up those performance points. Do you? I think that Christopher Bell is the biggest – uh, threat to get in between them or possibly take those performance points away, maybe even win this race. Do you see him being that sort of third uh, road course guy, or are you not ready to relinquish that from like Truex, or is there someone else that you're looking at? Because right now, Bell's in a tough spot. I mean, there's no PD upside, um, but I'm at an eight and a half because I really am worried that. Not worried in a bad way, but I really think he might dominate this race. I think I'm not ready to give him there, give him that title yet. I think Martin Truex teamed up with Cole Pern this weekend might be a little bit more of an edge, and this might be a nice little boost that they need to get into this final stretch of the playoffs. I lean that way a little bit, but based on the discount, I want all the exposure I can get to uh, Christopher Bell in the right setting. All right, uh, let's we got to pick this up just a little bit. Let's go with Harvick, eighty two hundred. He's starting seventh. He's led laps here in the past. Seems to be a decent road course for him. Not bad this year. I'm gonna be at an eight. I think there's some some room there to try to fit him in, be a little bit different with your lineups. Are you interested in Harvick at all? Uh, I've given him a seven and a half. I think he has a great ups or has great upside with that uh, price tag. But it's something that we have to look at. He's the only driver below the cut line that has to race his way in. We could see him get into some tussles at the end, and who knows how that hurt, might hurt his value. Um, I think 7.5 is a fine score there. Joey Logano, 8,100, starting third. I landed on a 7. I went back and forth uh, on a couple different drivers, and I just couldn't find a right mix of trying to find him a way for him to get in my lineup too often. I think he's a great tournament play, but his road course data this year is 
strong in some settings and not strong in some. It's just really hit or miss. And we talked about Penske's issues. I do want some exposure in tournament plays, but not over uh, at all really in cash game settings. You must have uh, changed your score because I have an eight on uh, this scoreboard that I'm looking at. So I have to make sure that I correct that because uh, I thought that we were a little bit further apart. Um, I'm at a six and a half on Logano. I thought that this was another one where we were going to be very different on, just similar to um, Kyle Busch. But I guess you've kind of reasoned up a little bit more looking at some of the data. So Logano, he is in play. He can lead these laps. We saw him. He did look really good at the Daytona road course, ultimately finished second to Christopher Bell. So there is upside with Logano, but yeah, we mentioned Team Penske, all these other issues. It's a tough one for me now. Now is when we get into, I think, between these next three to four drivers, they will be potentially some of the highest owned on the slate, and rightfully so. There is massive PD upside for these next guys. The pricing is pretty soft on them, and they all have pretty good road course you know results so we'll start with Matty D he's 7900 he starts 30th I'm gonna be an eight and a half he's he can really get around road courses his problem at Wood Brothers has seemed to have been the equipment and over the last few races on road courses it seems like they found something a little bit more if he can stay away from the Penske issues and then give him a solid car there's no reason why he can't get a top 15 here and then we're looking at 6x upside. So, Matty D, 8.5 for me. Yeah, place differential is the key for these next couple drivers. Key for Matty D, starting there at 30th position. I'm 7.5 because of having some stronger performances here recently. But I think the next driver, Tyler Reddick, 7,800, starting 29th. He's a checker flag in our race guide. If you want to check out our race guide, it's a great digital magazine to kind of pair with all the data and everything we're talking about. Gives you some additional slides and everything to view uh, with some uh, additional lineup uh, builds and things in there. So if you want to check it out, the link's below. But Tyler Reddick, checker flag for a reason. He's been really strong in road courses this year, really stepped up his game. I've given him an impact score of nine and a half. I really want a lot of exposure to him and it's a cash game build uh, for me, core building block. Yeah, man, I, I haven't decided how many lineups I'm going to enter yet, but I'm pretty sure Tyler Reddick will be in 100% of them. I just see so much upside. There's downside. There always is at these tracks. He's starting in the back 29th. He could get in trouble early and then really hurt his upside chances. So there is risk there. But I'm going to go ahead and give him a 10. Wow. Um, I just see you need to have some PD guys. Uh, I wanted to kind of separate who I thought was my favorite PD upside drivers. And Reddick has, I think he's already had two poles this year when like there's actually qualifying for road courses. Like He earned those poles. He can get around these tracks. Um, I think he had a, I forget exactly what his finish was. I think it was 12th here uh, last year, 12th or 14th. He's got massive upside. I'm at a 10. Another guy I got a lot of, uh, uh, I'm really high on is going to be Chase Briscoe. 7,600 starting 22nd. Nine and a half for me. He was in position late to win the Indy road course. By far, road courses have been his best tracks in his rookie season. I uh, like him a lot. Um, he will probably be close to 100% owned as well just because I, I can see him do it. And the 14 has run well here with Clint Boyer in the past, so I think they'll have a good setup for him. I like Briscoe a lot. I do too. I've given him a 9.5. I think all the points you just hit on, he's a great candidate to be in the optimal. These, this range right here I think is really where the difference is going to be, be made. I think a lot of ownership, though, is going to fall here. Justin Haley, 7,400. Starting 38th is somebody that offers that place differential. I don't know how strong this car is to get him the positions he needs. He is a good road course racer. I've given him a six because I want some exposure in tournaments, and I just don't think he's a great cash game play. Yeah, I think that he's just priced up a little too high for his equipment. Uh, I'm at a six. It can work out for him, especially if there ends up being a lot of uh, chaos. But I just don't see him having the ability to really get up front and pass guys. He needs things to happen for him to have a good result. Typically, I don't like that unless it's a super speedway. So ultimately, we'll see what we get out of Haley, but I'm at a six. Next uh, guy we want to talk about is Michael McDowell. 7,119th. 
Mr. Uh, they always tout him as a road course guy. But if you're really looking at his stats, they're really not that great. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the car. You know, if he was in better equipment, he'd probably get better results. I'm going to be at a four and a half on McDowell because I just haven't seen the speed, the results um, that makes me feel comfortable playing him when for a couple hundred dollars more we can get Briscoe or Reddick. Yeah, you would like to see a little bit more place differential upside with that price tag. He's I've given him a five because he has two top tens and six races on road courses this year, so he does have some upside, but you want to sparingly use him and probably in tournaments. Daniel Suarez, 7,000, starting 25th. I don't want as much exposure to him. I'm in a four because we've seen almost every road course race this year. They've had issues with either an engine, brake, something mechanical yep. has happened with that team. They don't have that figured out, so that's why I landed on a four with him. Yeah, because uh, we can go back a couple years ago when he was with uh, Stuart Haas. He was running top three uh, at different points in that race and looking good. This My rating of a four is really more about where they're at as a team in their road course package. It doesn't seem to be there, so I don't have much interest in him. I will have a little bit more interest in Chris Busher. He's 6,900. He's 16th. Kind of a sneaky guy. I think he'll get overlooked. Um, there's some upside there. I'm only at a six. I'm not going to be heavy on him if I ultimately go with him. But I think he's worth looking at. I think he can be a low ownership guy and and you know get you some nice points. Yeah, absolutely. I've given him a seven. He's got three top tens in the six road course races this year. Six top 20s. He's been consistent. One of the only drivers really to get this top 20 consistency of, of, of anybody in the entire field. So I like him in this setting. I think the uh, next driver we should talk about is Austin Dillon. He's somebody that uh, 6,514 uh, is his starting place you could look at, but he hasn't had the greatest road course uh, history. He uh, admittedly doesn't like road courses. It's not his favorite. He's gotten better, but with that price tag and that starting position, I've landed on a four. Yeah. You know, that was, it's funny because when we go back just a few years ago, basically before the Roval, there was only two road courses on the NASCAR circuit. So most drivers that weren't just naturally kind of good at them or had backgrounds with road courses, they didn't really try that hard. You could kind of tell it was always the road course guys up at the front. Well, now that there's like 16 road courses on the circuit now or on the schedule, <laughs> these guys are forced to be better at them, including this race, which is in the playoff, and it's an elimination race. All these drivers are forced to be better at this style of track. Dylan has improved, but in my opinion, has not improved enough to be worth considering in my lineups. I'm going to four on him. And a guy that's had really good runs at times, even in this lesser equipment, Eric Jones, 6,400. He starts 17th. I mean, you you got to have some of these six 6K guys. He's got top 10 upside. If he's able to do even kind of close to that, he'll be over 5X. So uh, I'm at a 7.5 on Eric Jones. I'm at an 8. We've seen him finish out of the six races three times in the top 15, and he only really needs to finish 14th and have that happen. And he's a 5X driver. We could easily see him in the optimal. Somebody that uh, we could talk about briefly is Joey Hand, 6,200 starting 32nd, or 36th. I've given him a 6. I think uh, – He's in the Stuart Haas equipment this week uh, with Rick Ware Racing uh, officially on the on the sticker. So we'll see how he can get something uh, if he can get some performance out of that. But thirty sixth at sixty two hundred, if he uh, gets a top twenty five, we're pushing five X. So it's going to be questionable. But I might have some exposure in tournaments. I can't believe you. I cannot believe you. When we were doing our projections, you kept talking this guy up. You talked him up. You were saying all this really great stuff, Stuart Haas, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, I don't know. I don't know anything about this guy, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm looking at your score. I gave him a six and a half based on everything you said, and you came in at a six. You came in lower than I did, and you were talking him up. So I don't know. Um, I agree with I agree with exactly what you're saying. He has the upside. He could finish 25th, and that's decent value. But I just can't believe that I had him rated higher than you, and you were telling me how good you thought he would do. Well, Cole Custer, <laughs> the next guy we're talking about, is 5,700 starting 23rd, and he have has an averaged uh, or he's averaged 21st place finish, which is the worst of all Stuart Haas cars. So that's kind of where I was coming from from that perspective. You gave a six and a half. I did a six because I think Cole Custer, we know where he can finish and we see that he won't have to pass as many cars and we know he's a little bit more of a 
has a solid equipment. So I've landed there a little bit stronger on him at a seven and a half comparatively. That's where I feel a little bit more confident in this range. How about you? Well, I, I mean, you talk about his struggles this year, but do you know where he finished last year? His only race out in the Roval? You know where he'd finish? Where'd he, where'd he finish? Ninth. He's got upside. He really does. I'm at a six and a half, though, because, like you said, hasn't had the best luck this year. But at 5,700, um, there, you know, when I gave this score, I had for, kind of forgotten that he had gotten a top 10 at the Roval. So I would be a little bit higher. Um, I do think he's actually going to be fairly highly owned. I've seen several uh, people on Twitter talking him up, thinking that he might end up in the optimal. I'm not ready to go there, but man. Uh, Cole Custer does look like he's in a decent position to help you build a really nice lineup because 5,700 is not that much of an impact. Another guy that you could consider down here, and there's really not many drivers left that I think are worth building your lineup. I'm probably going to stop around Cole Custer, but you may consider Corey LaJoy. 5,500, he starts 26th. I'm at a 5. Who knows what we really get out of him, but there's some nice PD upside there. Yeah, I'm at a 6. I think this is about as the lowest I would go. Uh, he's got three top 20s in the road course setting this year, which is almost there for the 5X. He could find a way to uh, to get a couple more positions. I think that's where I would be at the bottom. Last week's winner, Bubba Wallace, 5,300 starting 15th. It's really not his forte. The super speedway racing, we expect him to be competitive this week especially starting 15th, there's a discount, but it's going to be difficult for him to maintain with as many strong drivers in this field. I don't want to have very much exposure unless I'm taking a shot in the tournament. Yeah, I think if I'm just looking at a certain build and I have five solid drivers and I'm needing somebody, I may consider them, but ultimately I'm at a three and a half. Um, there's really not much interest uh, for Bubba Wallace for me. I mean, I think back a couple years ago, him getting dumped by Bowman because he was flipping him off for laps on laps. So he seems to get other drivers pissed off at him at these kind of races. Doesn't seem to work out in his favor ultimately. So he's a bit of a risk for me, but 5,300 is not that much. So, And if you want to check out all these uh, drivers' ratings, you can do that in our race guide. That download link is below. We appreciate you watching, and we're excited to uh, get this elimination race underway. Is there anything you want to add to wrap this up, Jeremy? Last thing is, is just, man, I'm looking forward to this race. This has become one of the best races in the playoffs. There's a lot of drama. Again, I talked about it, mistakes. You cannot make them, especially if you're a playoff driver and you want to move on. This will be an intense race. We saw a great finish uh, at the end of the Xfinity race already this year. So I think it should be a really fun one. Enjoy it. Um, don't look at your lineups too much because things can change quickly here. Yeah, this has uh, been fun. We're excited to be in studio to do this. Thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw, hit subscribe. We love the comments. So if you uh, want to let us know what you thought about the episode, drop a comment below. But for the DK Garage, I'm Joe. That's Jeremy, and we'll see you next time.